We get the presentation up on the computer here. Um, just a little background about what, what I'm going to be talking about today. I am a process engineer. Uh, like most of you, I'm a user of a lot of these technologies that are being uh, talked about uh, so far today. And what I'm going to be talking about is a study that we did looking at some of the different um, methods to kind of address some print problems that we were having in our facility. Um, you know, as, as these boards get more and more complicated, we get smaller and smaller parts, um, it becomes harder and harder to print them. But what makes it even more difficult is not everything on the board is shrinking. You've got some parts that are shrinking, you have very, very small deposits that you have to print, and you would like to go with a very th thin stencil, and there's, you know, things you can do to kind of address that, but at the same time, you've got, you know, some of these larger parts, some pen and paste parts, um, you know, parts with bigger pads that need a, a greater volume of paste. So the difficulty here is kind of balancing those two competing um, requirements there. Go to the next slide. So this is kind of the tug of war that we've got set up here. Um, we've got, on the one hand, the really big parts, uh, pen and paste are some of the worst offenders here. Uh, for those of you, you know, if you're not familiar with the pen and paste process, basically it's a through hole part that you're gonna print paste on top of the hole put the part down in the holes, and then during the reflow process, count on that paste sort of being pulled back into the hole and making your connection. So that requires a, a big volume of paste. But then sometimes on the same board, same side of the board, you've got little QFPs, QFNs, micro BGAs that uh, require a very small, highly controlled um, paste volume. So, you know, how do we sort of balance this? How do we um, address these competing requirements? So often stencil designers are faced with a choice. Okay, do I design for the small parts? If I do that, then I run the risk of starving these big parts of solder. Or do I design for the large parts? And if I do that, then we run into problems with consistency on the print of the really small parts. So what we did internally was, you know, kicked off this project. We need to investigate some methods to achieve acceptable results on both. Um, how do we kind of balance these two competing technologies or requirements? So this has already kind of been discussed. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Uh, Brian just you know, did kind of a, an overview of this well, as well, but um, just a real broad overview of the print process. Um, a board is brought into the printing machine. It's aligned to the stencil. It's brought up in contact with the bottom of the stencil so that all those apertures that you've got cut into the, um, the stencil are now aligned over those pads that you want to deposit paste on. Uh, at that point, the squeegee rolls paste across the stencil, filling all those apertures. The board is separated from uh, the stencil, and hopefully you get a situation like this where all that paste that you just rolled into those apertures sticks to the board, comes away from the stencil, and you've got a nice brick of paste there. Um, one of the things that we used to evaluate, you know, do this evaluation is, you know, we measured how much paste is left on the board as a function of as a percentage of that paste aperture, and that's that transfer efficiency that uh, has been mentioned a couple of times in the previous presentations. Okay, next. So area ratio, this is critical. Um, when you're designing a stencil, um, you need to know what your area ratio, particularly of your smallest pads are, uh, to kind of get a feel for whether or not this is gonna print, if it's gonna release. Um, and it's, as mentioned before, it's a ratio of the exposed pad on the board to the total aperture wall area on the stencil. And you take the exposed pad area, divide it by the aperture wall area, and what you want to see is a number that's 0.66 or larger. And what that means is it's basically a ratio, it's a percentage. You want the exposed pad to be at least 66% as big as your total wall area in the stencil. Uh, larger is better. If you've got something that's, you know, one or greater, that means you've got more pad than you have aperture, and you can print that all day. Um, you know, historically, we can, you know, go down to about that .66 ratio without too much issue. Once you get below that, it really starts to become, um, you kind of start to lose a little bit of control over the process. And that's sort of the arena that we're playing in right now, trying to figure out, okay, when we hit that .66 area ratio and go below, um, how do we consistently print? Uh, because it is going to happen. Uh, okay. This is kind of a visual, uh, um, some pictures of the problem that we're battling. Um, 
this is a, a DFN dual flat no lead package. Um, and you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but you've got a, a big heat sink in the middle uh, surrounded by a bunch of data pins. And in this particular case, those, you know, the data pins around the outside are right at the 0.66 area ratio threshold. So you can kind of see you got a couple of um, deposits there that are circled. And you can tell there's just not a, as much solder paste there as the other ones. So, you know, it printed most of them okay, but those two, you got um, visibly less solder paste there. And you can see what happens when it goes through the reflow process. This is the same part after reflow. Those same two pins, you don't have that nice solder fillet going out to the edge of the lead. So uh, we did some x-ray analysis here, and again, these are the same pins. Uh, you can see that you've got an electrical connection there, but um, it's just a much less consistent print, much less consistent looking joint. Um, you know, not only is it just some variation in the process that you don't want to see, but um, this wreaks havoc with AOI, you know, downstream when we start looking at inspecting this thing to determine whether or not we have a good solder joint. AOI is not going to see a solder joint there. It's going to call that out as a defect. And, you know, that, those are the, the false failures that, that was talked about earlier in the Omron presentation. Okay, next. So, our experimental design. Um, we set this up to look at, you know, several different factors to try to determine what we can do to address this problem. Now, our hypothesis going into this was a smoother stencil aperture wall is going to give us a better paste release. That's kind of the, you know, the, um, the assumption out there in the industry. You know, you look at the, the surface area of the wall, you want to see a nice, flat, smooth wall, and that should correlate to a nice paste release. So that was our hypothesis going into this. Um, you have less surface tension holding the paste in the aperture because you have less of that scalloping um, shape on the side of the walls. And also, you know, there's less physical area there too. When you think about it, if you've got that scallop texture, um, if you start adding up all the different, you know, the waves in that, that side wall, you know, effectively you're going to have more surface area there when you have a rougher wall. So smoother wall should give less actual aperture wall area and again should increase our release. Uh, there's a bunch of efforts out there in the industry to try to improve transfer efficiency, um, improve materials. We talked a little bit about the PhD material in an earlier presentation. That's one of the materials that we tested. Um, and also the higher frequency lasers. Uh, those things also, you know, purportedly give you a little bit smoother wall, which should give us better paste release. So those are the things we looked at, materials and laser, um, laser frequency. So our intent basically was, you know, you know, we want to know for ourselves uh, what materials out there and what solutions are out there that will work in our process and not just depend on, you know, what the industry says and what a stencil manufacturer tells us their, their material will do. So, you know, we bought this in-house and we um, tried to do the best we could to do an unbiased evaluation of these different methods. All right, next. So the materials we looked at, uh, we looked at PhD which is that finer grain stainless steel material that's already been discussed. Uh, we also looked at something called fine grain stainless, which is just another stainless steel alloy, um, similar to the PhD, but just in the way it's made, it's an even finer grain structure yet than the PhD, and it gives you even more of the benefit of the flatter surface as well as the um, smoother aperture walls. That's, uh, that's the claim. And then we also looked at nickel. You know, nickel's kind of been the standby for um, a lot of manufacturers when they really have problems. They, you know, nickel's the, the cure-all, right? So uh, we wanted to evaluate that as well. And we looked at laser-cut nickel as well as EFAB nickel. Uh, the different methods we looked at, um, four different methods. The older style pulsed YAG laser, which has been sort of the industry standard for years. Um, a lot of companies are coming out with these newer fiber optic lasers, which uh, effectively have a smaller spot size and they pulse much faster. So you get a, a much, um, much smoother wall surface. We'll see a couple of pictures later, but uh, what you get when you cut a laser or cut a stencil with one of these lasers, it's not just a continuous beam that cuts all the way around and gives you a nice smooth wall. They actually pulse it and you basically you drill a series of holes closely spaced that just steps around that aperture. 
And you can imagine as you do that, it kind of leaves a scalloped surface along the edge. Well, the new fiber optic lasers, they have a smaller beam and they pulse them faster, space closer together, so you get less of that scalloping, um, those scalloping features on the side, smoother wall. Uh, we also looked at electropolishing, which um, is a method, you know, been mentioned already, but the idea here is to sort of cut down some of that scalloped, that rough, those rough edges that are left behind um, after you get the, you know, the pulsing action of the laser. And then we looked at EFAB with the nickel material. Okay. So just a little bit about how we went about evaluating this. Um, Joel talked a little bit, you know, talked earlier about the Omron uh, solder paste inspection. We have a solder paste inspection in our facility. Um, this is a picture of it. It's the uh, same type of method as what Joel was talking about. I won't go into that, but um, we looked at, on this particular board, um, area ratios from about 1.2, which is you know, a nice big beefy pad that we should be able to print all day, all the way down to an area ratio of 0.6, which violates that, you know, that 0.66 threshold that's kind of been the, the standard. And then we also we have a scanning electron microscope in our Mayfield Heights facility. We use that to get some nice pictures of the surface of the walls as well as uh, measure the stencil thickness to kind of do some normalization of the data. Okay. Lost my page turner. Oh. <laughs> so this is a picture of the board. Um, it's what we call our Raptor Logic board. It's just one that we build in our Twinsburg facility, Twinsburg, Ohio. Um, it's got a nice mixture of components. It's got a lot of BGAs. Uh, the smallest BGA is a 0.5 millimeter pitch. There's a 0.4 millimeter pitch QFP and